agenda packet, which is the agenda plus the minutes, you can look on our website and it'll Thank be posted you. before the meeting. Perfect. Yeah, it just occurred to me that I didn't, I'm like, oh, well, I haven't even reviewed that. That is okay. Do not follow your vice chair's <laughs> example there, people. Welcome everybody. We're just uh, giving everybody another minute or two to log on and make sure we have quorum and then we'll get started. We appreciate you guys being here. Hi, Danielle, are you here as a proxy for someone? I'm sorry, you're on mute. Elizabeth Herbert. Thank you so much, appreciate sure. it. Madam Chair, you, or Madam Vice Chair, excuse me, you do have quorum. Awesome. Hi, hey everybody. Thank you for being here today. Um, this meeting will be recorded. Um, <laughs> so good afternoon, good afternoon, members of the MAG Regional Domestic Violence Council. This meeting is now called to order. This meeting is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube as a way for members of our public to participate. For those participating via Zoom, Please state your name when making comment or asking a question. I will ask that you keep yourself, your microphones on mute when you are not speaking. We will now begin the meeting with a roll call of all members. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Celeste Adams. Here. Thank you. Zach Altman. Emily Karen. Present. Thank you. Joshua Clark or Tanya Ruinton. I need a question. Councilmember Ellie Klein. Councilmember Christine Ellis. Councilmember Jerry Friedel. Present. Thank you. Cindy Garcia. Present. Thank you. Laura Guild. Present. Thank you. Christine Hunt McDonald. Present. Thank you. Danielle Shager on behalf of Elizabeth Herbert. Thank you. Council member Berdetta Hodge. Present. Thank you. Mary Lynn Kasinick. Here. Thank you. Patricia Clark. <laughs> Council member Sherry Loritano. Andrew Lefevre. President Beazin. Thank you. Chris Sund on behalf of Rick Levis. Kevin Mattingly. Amy Offenberg. Here. Thank you. Carol Park Aiden. Oh, was I heard? I can't. I've been having connectivity issues off and on all day. This is Carol. Thank you. Kristen Charlotte. It appears her audio is still connecting. Kristen Charlotte. I'm here. Thank you. Elizabeth Saldana Urbieta. Melissa Thomas Brickhouse. Present. Thank you. Vice Mayor Kathy Tilkey and Vice Chair D.C. Ernst. Present. Thank you. Present. Vice Chair, you have quorum. Did I miss anyone? Oh, Council Member Lupe Bandine. Present, thank you. 
Well, again, thank you all for being here today. Unfortunately, our chair was not able to attend, so I will be uh, leading. Our next uh, item is a call to the audience. This is the opportunity for the public to comment on items that fall under MAG's jurisdiction that are not on the agenda or that are on the agenda for discussion and not for action. Members of the public could submit written comments via the MAG website one hour prior to the meeting. Staff, do we have any written comments? Madam Vice Chair, we do not have any comments on this item or any other items on our agenda. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Our next item is the approval of the February 2nd, 2023 uh, meeting minutes. Do any member of the council have any questions? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the minutes? I, Bredetta Hodge, Council Member Bredetta Hodge, move to approve the minutes. Thank you. We have a motion um, from, I'm sorry, I was <laughs> reading my notes. I'm Council sorry. Member Hodge. Thank you, Council Member. Um, and a second, is there a second for this motion? Jerry Friedel, second. Thank you, Jerry. The second on that. Staff, can you please take roll call vote? Yes, mm -hmm. Chair. Or Madam Vice Chair, excuse me. Celeste Adams. Approve. Thank you. Council Member Lupe Bendin. Approved. Thank you. Emily Karen. Emily? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? We're voting on minutes. Do you approve? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Jerry Friedel. Approved. Thank you. Cindy Garcia. Approved. Thank you. Laura Guild. Approved. Thank you. Christine Han McDonald. Approved. Thank you. Danielle Shager on behalf of Elizabeth Herbert. Approved. Thank you. Council Member Berdetta Hodge. Approved. Thank you. Mary Lynn Kasinick. Approved. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. Amy Offenberg. Approved. Thank you. Andrew Lefevre. Approved. Thank you. Carol Park Aiden. Abstain only because this is my first uh, uh, meeting. Thank you. Liz, uh, excuse me. Melissa Thomas Brickhouse. Approved. Thank you. Vice Chair DC Ernst. Approved. Thank you. Thank you. Did I oversee anybody? Did I overlook anybody? Please come in. Okay. Um, Madam Vice Chair, I did have one additional uh, announcement that should have been included in your agenda. And I apologize. We do have several new members who are joining us for the first time today. And I thought you might want to give them a moment to just introduce themselves. I believe this is Emily, Karen, and Carol's first meeting. So perhaps we want to let them just say hello. Absolutely. Carol? Hi, I'm Carol, Carol Park Aiden. Uh, I retired from the Attorney General's Office as an Assistant AG in Child Support Enforcement. I hate to say how many years ago. I unretired. I'm presently a family law attorney with Community Legal Services uh, here in Phoenix. Excellent. Glad to be here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Emily? Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Emily Karen. I am the victim advocate with the Gilbert Police Department. Um, I was previously with the Pinal County Attorney's Office. I've worked for the YMCA. Um, so I've had a little bit of different things in my background. Very excited to be with Gilbert. I've been here for about a year and I'm stepping into Sergeant Brandon Wilson's seat. So I really appreciate you including me. We appreciate you being here today, Emily. Thank you for being here. And just to conclude our uh, item three, um, I wanna thank you all. And I believe the motion has carried, thank you. Vice Chair, oh. I apologize. I overlooked uh, Kristen Charlau on the oh. vote, on the voice vote for minutes, I apologize. Chris, what do you wanna do? I, I think I'll approve. Thank you, my apologies. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. All right, um, we're moving on then. Our next item is updates on the two domestic violence work groups. The first uh, to present will be me, lucky y'all, um, on the teen dating violence work group. And that will be followed by council member Brandon on the community college crisis workforce work group. Um, so 
Thank you guys again for being here. Uh, we had a meeting on March 27th, which followed the February uh, teen dating awareness, violence prevention awareness month, uh, and all of the great um, um, webinars that were held on, on MAG, by MAG, but that Bloom 365 provided the presenters on. Um, and I'd like to take the opportunity to thank them for all the work that they put into putting those presentations on. Those videos are still available on the MAG, MAG website um, for individuals who weren't able to be there and view um, the presentations live. Um, We've uh, they've gotten some positive feedback from uh, Bloom 365 has by participating in that. It's actually increased their um, um, view in the community. So they're, they're getting more contact from individuals who are interested in learning more about the programs that they have to offer. As we continue to move forward um, in our work group, uh, we're looking at what are the next things that we want to prepare for. And the first thing we decided is last year or this year, we seem to put this webinar together pretty quickly. And, and I commend the MAG staff and Bloom 365 again for getting that done so quickly. So we're actually going to start a little bit earlier this year and starting to plan how we would like um, to uh, provide education next year. So uh, we're looking at starting to plan Webinars for February for February 2024. We'll start looking at that planning in August of this year. Um, moving forward, the work group is looking at um, developing best practices for getting information out and um, for the language and the education that we're using to try to get this information out um, to our youth as well as parents. Um, teachers, support systems for youth. Um, we want to look at um, engaging faith-based communities um, in getting this information out. And again, we want to look at creating best practices. So our next meeting is being held on Monday, April 24th at 3 p.m. If you're able to join us, it is a web-based meeting. We would love to have you come. If your agency, your community has some best practices that you would like to share with us, if you know of a school that has a best practice, please bring that to uh, the meeting as we look to develop something that maybe we could write up um, and be able to provide on the MAG website um, for other agencies and other communities to look at. And with that, um, I should I open it up for questions or should I go ahead and, and pass it on? What do you think, Kelly? I think opening up to questions and then handing it off to Vice Mayor Bendine makes sense. Awesome. Does anybody have any questions regarding um, the update on the work group? Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> So thank you. Next, I'd like to pass uh, the microphone over to Council Member Bandine, who will be presenting again on the Community College Crisis Workforce Workgroup. Council Member? Thank you, uh, Vice Chair. And so um, we're uh, just going to give a little update on our Crisis Workforce Workgroup. And we actually had, um, we've put together a Future of Advocacy video. And in the video, we have some advocates that were um, interviewed by our chair, Norton, and by our uh, council member, um, Ellis from Chandler. And uh, so we have the Future of Advocacy video, and we also put together a PowerPoint that talks about the different opportunities, uh, educational opportunities at the uh, community college level. So we had our first presentation at the city of Tolleson on March the 29th. Uh, it was a co-meeting between the City of Tolleson JAG and their team council. And um, Chair Norton and uh, Sam Hinchy and myself were there. And so we did our first presentation. We showed the students the future of advocacy video. And then we went through the PowerPoint, which talked about the entry level jobs available in the um, crisis, crisis work and also the different um, opportunities for education at the Maricopa County Community College level, current classes, um, degrees, certification, certificate programs, and fast track programs that are available to help people get started in their careers, or even just to find out whether they're really interested in, in uh, 
uh, crisis workforce. So it went really well, and we were really happy with the way the presentation went. We um, asked the, the students to come to stay after and talk to us. And actually, they just started coming to us afterwards, which was really nice and gave us really good feedback. We told them we need to know what worked, what didn't work, what would they like to see. And so they um, did give us some pretty good suggestions that we're going to work on for the next presentation that we have. And then the next item is that we did go to our first um, uh, actual career day. We went to a career development day. It was a state conference for JAG. It was held in Mesa at the Mesa Conference Center. So we actually had our really nice uh, custom tablecloth and our retractable banner. And then the three of us plus another gal um, were there giving out information and talking to the students about uh, crisis workforce um, work group uh, jobs and careers. And so it was really interesting. We, um, that conference actually can have up to 700 people. So we saw hundreds and hundreds of kids there and we were really happy. We got a great spot. We had a lot of kids coming to talk to us and it was really gratifying to have one student in particular come over and tell us how happy they were to see. She was so happy to see her career um, being um, promoted there at the conference. So that was really great because that was some, that's something that she's going into and she had she was really happy to see somebody there promoting the career that she wants to get into. So it was really great. Um, we're looking forward to um, uh, going to our next um, present, having our next presentation. So our presentations, we're gonna try to uh, uh, talk to some other youth groups and volunteer groups so that we can uh, set up some times to, to show our presentation. And also we're going to be looking for some dates on other career days and freshman orientations at the other colleges. So we'll expand our information from the community college into universities also when we get moving uh, from community college level over to university level. So anyway, it was we're really pleased with how it's going. We're gonna do some adjustments to the presentation like editing our video and putting um, more information in our handouts. But we were really pleased with um, our, our shot out the gate here. So it was really, um, we're really pleased with it and uh, we'll just keep going. And if anybody wants to join us, our next meeting will be on April the 27th at three o'clock. Thank you. Excellent work, thank you. Does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask or any comments? Well, that is great work, thank you so much. Um, and just because I don't have a great memory for this, I guess I do have a question. Have we shown that video yet to this whole group? No, we haven't. Um, we're we're going to edit it a little bit, and then I'll be pleased to show that and have it available. We do want to have it available on the website because we did on our flyers that we're giving to the students. Um, we're handing out flyers prior to any of the presentations we're doing. We're putting that little QR code on it so that they can check it with their phone, scan it with their phone, and go straight to our website there at MAG, and that video hopefully will be there once we get it finalized, we're, we're going to do a little bit more editing. The kids gave us good feedback on how to get that, that uh, video a little bit edited, you know, so that it stays, you know, it's interest more interesting for them and not too long. So anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, we'll make sure that it's on the website. And plus, maybe we could show it at one of our meetings. That'd be a great idea. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we'll try to get that on an agenda. You let us know when it's ready to go. I appreciate Thank you. you. Thank you. We'll do that. Again, great work that workforce group. Nice job. Um, so again, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, we are looking for additional members for both of these groups. So if you're looking to participate, please let Kelly or Mimi know and they'd be happy to send you the invites to those next meetings. Um, so uh, our next agenda item is an update on abuse and later life grant. Um, and I believe Jody will be um, from DES will be presenting. Jody, are you ready? Actually, or I'm presenting. I was like, uh, we'll see, okay. yeah. Jody is actually in her meeting, her monthly meeting right now. So our meetings overlap uh, occasionally. So I, she asked me to give a just a quick update. Awesome. Laura Guild, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, so I think that most of you have been aware of the Abuse and Later Life <clears throat> grant, and it's certainly written into the agenda 
Kelly has provided a good overview. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We are, the CCRT <clears throat> is currently at 72 people. However, we have a regular, what's going on? Just when I start to talk. <laughs> Sorry. We My have mom would say, throw your hands up in the air and somehow that's supposed to help you. I don't know how. <laughs> are you kidding she me? She was a nurse. I trusted her. <laughs> <laughs> We have a current attendance of about 23 people, which is pretty good for a CCRT, particularly when it meets monthly. It may, and it's made up of obviously the key partners of um, prosecutors, law enforcement and victim services. And Mary Lynn can certainly speak to the victim service piece if she wishes to after I'm done. So um, and the CCRT, you want to build a systems response to older victims. So that is the long-term plan. In the meantime, with all of these additional partners coming on board, we've brought in a lot of organizations that not necessarily deal with um, seniors, uh, elder in the victim sense of the word, but really provide services to seniors of which could be in a experiencing some level of victimization. So I think right now what we're doing is being able to provide a lot of outreach and education about elder abuse and about how um, it can impact people. So I think the community awareness piece is really strong right now in this organization. Um, we're still in the phase of training law enforcement, uh, training prosecutors and victim services about the legal system and the response to strengthen that, that's the long-term goal. Um, with the intention though, that once the federal grant has ended, that this can be a viable community response to elder abuse. And so I think it's really in a, a good building phase. People are interested. They want to come into the meetings and see what's going on. Example today, when I left the meeting, they were having a training on, um, uh, exploitation, the scams that are out there that are rampant um, and impacting elder abuse. So that kind of information is really um, educational, as well as touching on another form of victimization. So, so we'll be continuing this grant. Hopefully, uh, it will be continued with a uh, continuation grant at, for next year and then beyond that. So it's really uh, the ultimate goal is to build a firm community response in Maricopa. And Mary Lynn, I don't know if you want to say anything because you are more engaged in the victim response side. So feel free. Yeah. Okay. Well, just real quickly, because uh, my um, internet is real unstable today. I've been knocked out three or four times, but um, yeah, what we're really focusing on is trying to help individuals um, with what we'd say like almost emergency housing. And so we have a, a hotel voucher program where we can put someone up for 10 days, which, you know, then is a real struggle to try to find them someplace uh, to go. Um, and I think uh, Janae reported that we've seen like 23 individuals since um, like October, November. And um, so anyway, but I think it's, uh, you know, rather than them just becoming homeless, uh, they have the opportunity. And of course we have the huge Doves program that has mobile advocacy, has support groups, um, has lay, you know, lay, uh, legal assistance. Um, and then of course we have the transitional housing um, and so once they've come into the system, there's lots of resources. And because it's a part of the larger area agency and our 50 some programs, um, we can get some other things like, you know, rides and if they do get somewhere, we can help them with in-home services and so forth. So it's going uh, extremely well. Okay, then that concludes our update. If there's any questions, we'd be happy to uh, try to answer or certainly refer you to Jody if that's needed. So. Thank you, Laura uh, and Marilyn. Are there any questions from the members or comments? All right. 
Again, thank you for the update. Um, next on the agenda is uh, My Dog is My Home, um, which is a national nonprofit dedicated to expanding access to shelter for individuals experiencing homelessness and their companion animals. They work to assist service providers to expand their programming to allow humans and their companion animals to remain together. Founder of My Dog is My Home, Kristen Kim, and her co-presenters from the Urban Resource Institute will present on this item. Her co-presenters are, uh-oh, <laughs> please forgive me if I say your name wrong, which I probably will, uh, Jitami Whiting. Close enough, yes, oh. Jitam Whiting. <laughs> Jitam Whiting, thank you so much for your kindness. Um, from PALS, People and Animals Living Safely, training and outreach coordinator, and Lena Cohan, PALS supervisor. Thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Christine Kim. I'm the founder and a board member of My Dog is My Home. And I just want to thank you for the invitation to be here today to present to the Regional Domestic Violence Council. Um, it really means a lot that you are interested and invested in our mission and learning more about keeping people and their animals together, um, as well as removing barriers to accessing shelter. Um, so as um, as it was mentioned, My Dog is My Home is a national nonprofit. and. We um, provide spaces where providers with varying levels of experience can get together and learn from each other uh, in regards to co-sheltering people and pets together. Um, we used to spend a lot of time educating folks on the need, like why is it important to keep people and animals together? Um, but as our work continues, we find ourselves needing to do that less and less. Um, providers sort of intuitively know and from their experience and just from having um, their experience as providers, you know, providing services and shelter, um, but also their experience personally as you know, a pet owner, um, they know that the human animal bond is really important. Um, and people who are really bonded to their animals um, find the no pets allowed rule in shelters to be a barrier when they're seeking safety. And so uh, I'm going to spend less time talking about the why today. I think it's really more important to talk about the how and to also showcase an example of a program that has been sheltering people and pets together in a domestic violence shelter setting um, and to showcase how successful it has been. Um, also the evolution of a program over 10 years of service. Um, and also just to give some hope to other providers out there in different communities that it is possible. There are other programs doing it and um, you can do it too. And so with that, you know, my dog is my home would like to give the floor to Urban Resource Institute, which is really the practice area expert, um, in my opinion. And so uh, I will hand things over to Lena and Jetem from here. Thank you so much, Christine, for thank thinking you. of us for this opportunity. And thank you all for having us as well. Um, we're gonna keep it brief, but we do wanna give you just a brief overview of the services that we give and what we're all about. I don't know who's screen sharing, but can you go to the next slide? Thank you so much. Um, so a little bit about Urban Resource Institute, better known as URI. We are um, located in New York City. So we are coming in from New York City today. Um, and we've been a human service provider for over 40 years in New York City. We did start small. Um, and as the years have gone by, we currently have 14 and counting domestic violence shelters in the New York City area. Um, we service all most boroughs except for Staten Island. Um, and we serve, um, we serve survivors of domestic violence as well as homeless families. Um, and our focus is really on marginalized communities and people in vulnerable populations. Um, we have robust programs and I don't wanna to speak too much to the other programs because PALS is the focus, but we do offer um, teen intervention. I know someone mentioned that earlier today, what you have going on in Arizona, um, we do, abusive partner intervention where we're talking to the abusers and trying to course correct behavior. 
Um, within our shelter systems, we have legal services, economic empowerment programs, since a lot of domestic violence survivors have been subject to economic abuse. Um, and we have PALS, which is what we're gonna talk more about today, which is our People and Animals Living Safely program. And we also have, go ahead, Lena, you wanna oh, jump in? I was in? just gonna, while we're talking about shelter, that we are actually the largest provider of shelter um, for folks in the country um, and in New York City, but usually the biggest anything in New York City is the biggest anything in the country. So just to make that clear. Yes, and we also have crime victim services where people are able to get some sort of compensation for damages that they've um, endured during their abuse as well. So we try to help the individual as much as we can and aid them to self-sufficiency. That is our main goal as a, a company as a whole. You can go to the next slide. So a little bit more about our program specifically, um, we do crisis intervention. So we have a referral system where you can email us and we will be including that email address at the very end. Um, so we're talking to a lot of individuals and families while they're still in that dangerous situation, while they're trying to figure out what's the next step for them and their pets. So then that's where we offer that pet inclusive safety planning. Sometimes it may not mean coming into one of our shelter facilities, but sometimes it means getting a referral to a community resource or getting more information about the options that they have. Um, and then sometimes it does result into them coming into our facilities. And out of the 14 facilities that we have currently, in nine of the shelters we have co-living where families are staying with their pets. Um, while they're with us, we do try to offer pet supplies throughout their stay to cut that cost um, so that they can save for permanent housing and the next step of their journey. We do have partnerships that allow us to provide basic veterinary care free of charge for families like vaccinations and things of that sort. If humane education is needed, we sometimes intervene and we can provide behavioral support for certain animals that are going through trauma. Um, and we definitely keep the door open for our families when they're leaving our facilities. We still wanna advocate and provide aftercare for them um, and just have that door open so that if they have any questions, if they need those referrals, that we're still a reliable source of support for them. Um, and recently we've been growing our technical assistance and training department. The goal here is for us to no longer say that we are the only fully pet inclusive program in New York City. We want other providers to be able to adapt pet inclusive policies and procedures so that we can just help more people because a lot of people have pets and so many people need help. And although this program exists, we're not able to service everyone that comes to us. So we wanna help bridge that gap. You can go to the next slide. A little bit about what it looks like for pets in shelter. We accept any animal legal to own in New York City, and we have a limit of three pets per family, um, depending on the unit size and space as well. Um, and we do not place any families with pets in shared units, and that's just to limit risk and comfortability levels and things of that nature. We don't have any breed or weight restrictions when it comes to dogs, just because people with pets already have so many barriers. We wanna try to limit the barriers that we're putting up when it comes to them seeking safety. We're more concerned with the temperament of the animal than the size. And so we do do screening processes prior to them coming in just to get a feel of what the animal is like. Um, there are no pets. Go ahead, Lena. Oh, I was just going to say, there's a, we, we have a big focus on equity in our program. Um, we want to be able to reach out to marginalized communities, especially, and we know that there is a history of uh, discrimination against certain pet breeds and that that bleeds over to their owners. Um, and so we're trying very hard to be client-centered and trauma-informed um, and not having any kind of specific breed um, restrictions, I think, is a big part of that. Um, Go ahead, Jatim. Okay. <laughs> there are no pets allowed in common areas with the exceptions of dogs in the hallways, stairways, and elevators for walking purposes. Um, it's not really for pets to socialize. It's for families to stay with their full family unit and so that we're not re-traumatizing individuals and families by having them separate from their pet in an already 
crisis moment. Um, and we don't expect our residential staff to handle and interact with animals. One thing about our program, with the growth of our program, we've been able to have people go in and actually work with those families one-on-one. -on -one, and that kind of helps staff buy in and combat like their fears or allergy concerns and things of that nature. So we have designated staff to basically provide case management for the pets in this situation. You can go to the next slide. Lena, you could take it away. Sure. So this is just a slide of our um, stats and how many families that we've helped. And the numbers actually, I think, are out of, uh, uh, we have slightly more updated numbers even, um, that we've had over 600 pets. Um, and I think it's closer to 475 families and individuals. Um, again, we see any types of animals. We do not discriminate against small breeds even fish. Um, these are animals that bring some type of emotional support um, to their families. Um, next slide, please. And so we want to talk about the growth of the program, because when we come in and talk about our program, a lot of people are like, well, you're the largest provider of shelter in the city. Of course, you can handle this. You have a whole team who can handle this. And the reality is, is that in 2013, we didn't have any dedicated staff working on the PALS program. We just launched a pilot in one location, and all they accepted were cats because there were no animal experts and they had just started making connections with animal welfare experts in the city. And so they took their time, they did it baby steps. And then, you know, once they were confident that like, oh, this is much easier than expected. Um, and when our program is working, most staff tell us that like, I don't even know there are, you know, 10 families with, you know, big dogs all around, like, you know, we try to, like Jatema said, cut down on interaction. Mostly this is a space for them to heal together. They can go outside if they need to go walk or whatever the case may be, but mostly it's self-contained um, in their own spaces. Um, and so we currently operate, like she said, out of um, nine of our shelters. These are both emergency and tier two, which is transitional housing. Um, and, uh, you know, basically every year and every year or two in the first, I would say five years of the program, we would add a new shelter as staff became more comfortable um, and then go in, you know, to the new shelter, kind of do some prep work ahead of time to repair everyone, answer questions, try to alleviate fears as much as possible, and then keep things moving. Um, and then our technical assistance program, obviously, we're growing that as much as possible because the need is incredibly great. I think we had over a thousand people calling us for help, asking, you know, for shelter that we could not address because, again, even though we're a large provider, we need multiple um, facilities to help us kind of manage that burden. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> These are some of our clients, our former clients who have gone through our program. And like we said, um, all breeds, all types, these animals are important to their families. We've, I, I don't know if you can tell, but in the middle, that's a bearded dragon who's kind of blending in to their Heidi space. Um, lots of cats and dogs, those are the most common animals in the system. Turtles are a surprising third to me. Um, bunnies, birds, um, all kinds of animals. Uh, we haven't had any snakes yet, but I'm really hoping one day. Um, <laughs> next slide, please. Yeah, so this is our information. Christine, we're so sorry, we forgot to put your information in here. Um, but Christine, do you wanna give your email address so that folks can reach out to you too? Sure, I mean, um, URI, the team at URI and my dog is my home. Um, we're yeah, generally we tag, so close tag together. teaming each other <laughs> anyway. Um, my dog is my home has a, a great national view. And so, um, you know, if you're looking for a resource or something that fits a program model that is outside the, the exact expertise or experience of URI, we can help sort of identify that resource. But URI has wonderful, wonderful experience for 10 years of sheltering people and animals together. So they are absolutely, um, you know, like an open book. Um, and there's like and no charge to our TA stuff. Um, we are very interested in um, having conversations. We know that, you know, different areas are going to have different needs and different issues come up, but it does seem like there's always kind of similar, at least the, the similar like skeleton of like, 
what do you do about cleanliness? What do you do about, you know, a dog bite, which, you know, in the life of our program, I knock on wood every time, but we've never had a dog bite um, happen on site. No one has gotten hurt due to an animal. Um, we had a cat lost, lost once, um, but that means that the cat was hiding really well in their unit and the owner couldn't find it. We shut down the shelter very briefly while we were trying to find this cat and we found the cat in one of the um, <laughs> cabinets, I think, just hiding really well. Um, but we're happy to take any questions if there is time. Um, yeah, and please reach out to us. Let us know if you have questions or want to connect. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, I think it's dinner time in New York right now. <laughs> so <laughs> I appreciate you guys taking time out of your evening to present. Uh, do any of the members have any questions or comments? Hearing none, um, again, we really appreciate your time um, and the great work that you're doing. We, like in, in Maricopa County, as you probably know, have the same issues about making sure that people who need shelter have access, especially when they have pets. So we greatly appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thank All you. Right. Thank you all so much. Moving to item number seven. Our next agenda item will be presented by Dr. Ijoma Obije, oh, I'm gonna say it right, Ojibenai, hopefully, close. Um, she is an assistant professor at Arizona State University in the School of Social Work. Her research investigates how intimate partner violence and IPV services impact health and well being, and how this impact varies across culture, race, and ethnicity. She will present to the council an overview of one of her most current projects Bank on Other Mothers, Boom. Um, Boom is a savings group program that aims to reduce depression and intimate partner violence among young mothers with a history of foster care living in Arizona. The program is in its initial phase. Doctor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello. Um, hard to present after the beautiful animals that were just shown on the screen, but I'll try. Um, and thank you, Dolores, for the introduction. Um, I am here, as Doris mentioned, to talk about BOOM, um, and it is in a pilot phase right now, but I will talk about the development process and where we're at now. And all of these um, partners on the bottom have either funded the study or have um, partnered in terms of letting us um, be able to deliver the program at their agency. So Thrive AZ, Onward Hope, and partnering for um, being funded through NIH or NIMH. The and um, Arizona State University. I, I if we move to the next slide. Um, so I won't go through all of these, but these are the primary objectives of the program, which is to encourage financial empowerment um, and provide a supportive environment to discuss intimate partner violence or IPV and the norms driving it, increase coping skills um, related to how to deal with or with intimate partner violence and mitigate the negative impact of intimate partner violence and fostering positive mental health. Um, so I describe this as a savings group and usually the first question is what is a savings group? Um, so a savings group um, is very common. It's also known as microfinance or in different countries, but it's very common in um, developing countries where a group of people meet, whether it's weekly, monthly, um, and get together to save money. But in addition to saving money, they're also providing social support where they talk about life goals, um, as well as any problems that might be happening in their lives. Um, and these types of groups have been shown to decrease the risk of intimate partner violence um, and improve mental health. Um, and challenges among women living in developing countries, but it's not as common in the US. Um, it is common among some immigrant groups, but not generally with um, the general US population. And I won't show a video here, um, but I think the slides will be or were already shared with you. But if you're interested in getting like a short three minute idea of what a savings group looks like in the context of Boom, the program, this is an example um, that we showed moms who, um, participated in phase one of the study, which I'll share a little bit about um, what we envisioned the program to look like and got feedback based on that video that was shared. 
Um, so to be able to participate in the program, these are the different criteria that moms have to, to meet. So it's very narrow, um, but it's also a population that unfortunately does not receive our, as many services, services once they age out of the foster care system. So 18 to 24 year old moms who are pregnant or parenting with history of foster care residing anywhere in Arizona, um, they don't have to report current, meaning like in the past year experiencing intimate partner violence, but they do have to have a history of it. Um, and we define intimate partner violence very broadly um, to include um, controlling behavior, technology or digital abuse, um, financial abuse, um, emotional or psychological abuse. So it's, it's defined pretty broadly. Um, and also they have to be in a steady or casual relationship um, with a male partner. And there are two phases, I, or at least I describe the study as two phases or two steps. And um, the first step we have finished already, which was really to develop the manual, the program manual. Um, so um, what we did in order to develop the manual was that we interviewed one-to-one um, -one interviews or did focus groups with young moms. So those who met the eligibility criteria. Um, and also fathers, because we wanted to understand how can we make this intervention as safe as possible as well. Um, and I can give a little bit of background for why we wanted to know that is because in other um, parts of the world, it has also been shown that these groups might increase the risk of violence sometimes if a partner who, for example, doesn't want um, his partner to be involved in any sort of savings group or to have access to money and might upset their partner and that can lead to an increase in violence. So wanting to understand whether that was a risk and if so, how can we um, decrease that risk? And we also um, interviewed key informants such as yourselves um, in the community to understand what, what they felt should be included um, in the intervention. And then step two or phase two, which is the um, phase that we're currently in, is now we have developed the program manual based on all of the interviews that we've done. And we are piloting the program um, in two different stages. I call the first stage, stage 1A, which is like the mini pilot with five moms to further adapt the manual based on their actual participation and feedback. So they would, they would participate, the five moms would participate in the program as if they were regular participants and based on what we developed from step one or phase one. Um, and we would interview them after their final participation in the final session, so the sixth week, to understand what they what was their um, opinion about the different content or materials that included in the program and then further adapt the manual and then move into stage 1B, which would be the main pilot, and to branch out to more moms um, to understand whether it actually leads to the predicted or hypothesized outcomes. And we have followed those moms for three months to see whether um, there were improvements in terms of their mental health and hopefully decreased risk of intimate partner violence. So we've started and we're currently in um, phase one and there's been two out of six sessions that have occurred and so far the feedback has been positive. Um, and we will start um, phase two, we anticipate starting the week of May 8th or May 10th on a Wednesday. Um, here are just some things, I, I won't go over everything, but just to give you some more background on what we found from the first phase or step one or phase one um, and how we developed the manual and what the manual includes or the sessions for each boom session um, includes is um, one of the things that we found is that moms really needed in this, in this particular population of moms, um, some sort of education on what is intimate partner violence. Um, in some cases, I have some quotes here, I won't read it, but these are some quotes that really, um, I guess, exemplify or the different themes that came out in terms of the need for IPB education. So moms viewing IPB as something that quote unquote is normal, um, particularly within their generation. Um, and it says, for example, um, I won't read this, but some people think being toxic in a relationship is nice, they enjoy it. Um, also, this need to understand what IPB is and its effects on you and your child, um, and especially a special focus on emotional IPB. Um, we see it, it's come up recently in the current um, 
pilot, but also in the interviews where moms don't feel like they really belong in this type of group if they've only experienced psychological abuse. Um, they don't feel that it's, it, it warrants, I guess, this type of an intervention. This intervention is more for someone who would have experienced severe IPV, so that needs to really understand that the effects of emotional or psychological abuse are similar, if not sometimes worse than um, if you experience physical abuse and also understanding the impact it has on their current relationships, on their parenting, mental health, effects on their children, um, and hopefully preventing um, their child from experiencing it in the future. Um, and the need to create a safety plan as well um, has also, was also a theme that came up related to education. A second thing was education about how to cope with mental health effects of intimate partner violence. And I think everyone knows in this room the effects of it, all of the mental health effects. But unique to this population was also um, that compound trauma. When we talk about IPB, foster care, as well as their role as a mother, mother and, and many of them were single moms or first time moms as well. Um, in this quote here, because like I said, the whole combination of being a mother and a foster child at the same time, it's kind of hard because you don't really have like people that you can go to for, that should be for support mentally. So if you can have a group that you could talk to and tell them about what goes on in your life and stuff would be great, kind of like counseling basically, so it'll be great. Um, and there are also some positive themes that came out with how they actually coped in the past or currently with intimate partner violence through social support from family, friends, church, and therapy. And then social support, and that should be opportunities to um, receive social support and also provide that giving back was a big theme um, that was came up in the interviews as well through their participation in the group. Um, and wanting to help others, but also wanting to make just connections beyond the group. And these are just some examples of how they would want to do that through play dates, mommy only events, um, and also group exercises that involve cooperation and interdependent goals. That was more thing through the key informant interviews. And all of these different financial education pieces um, came up as well in the interviews, the need to um, discuss financial literacy, financial planning, management, and empowerment as well. So um, really when thinking about financial planning, not just for themselves, but for their children. And that quote here also shows that as well as um, finding work or employment was also a major barrier for um, moms in this population as well. So with those interviews, this is what the Boom program um, is currently manualized to be. Um, and we have a session that's just one-to-one -one first where we provide feedback on like an assessment that we do related to intimate partner violence and their history with it, um, depression specifically, and also we do safety planning one-to-one -one with the moms. And then there are, after the first session, the rest of them are all group sessions where um, it's focused on building social cohesion, um, understanding the difference between unhealthy versus healthy relationships, um, also some financial um, literacy and planning in session four, and um, coping with intimate partner violence, which is session five. And then session six is kind of a celebration and graduation of all of their accomplishments through, um, through the sessions. And a key part of this group also is the savings group piece. So every week that they meet, um, in session one, they committed through a savings plan how much they would contribute um, each week through um, a group savings. So we use this app called Braid app where moms contribute money weekly, whatever they de determine in session one, they would continue to contribute it to the group so that they can hold each other accountable um, for their saving and hopefully be more, more motivated to save as well while they're meeting. Um, I don't know if I need to go through all of this. I don't know how much time I have left. So I, I think um, I think we can move past this slide. I think everyone knows that it's a huge issue, especially in Arizona, which is what the next slide says. And um, I was um, somewhat new to Arizona um, and we can advance to the next slide. Um, in 2019, I moved here. So I was surprised to learn that the rate is actually um, slightly higher in Arizona than other states. Um, and also know that IPV is, tends to be most prevalent during adolescence and young adulthood, and then it begins to decline with age. 
Um, we can go to the next slide. And it just really summarizes just some of the research. I'll jump to the bottom in terms of there's not enough research, particularly with this population, which means there's not enough programs and interventions for this population. And we just did a study, um, Dr. Ferguson, who's also on the call, and I are co-authors on a study where we found only two interventions um, that specifically focused on intimate partner violence and targeted um, young people with a child welfare history. So most of these programs or studies tend to focus on their caregiver or their witnessing, but not the direct experience um, or the direct history with intimate partner violence. And then also we did a study with 201 moms, uh, not moms, excuse me, young women, 18 to 24, to inform, again, the need for this grant that we received. And these are just rates, which I think are pretty similar, but um, um, to, the, to the national rates of about 30%, but during pregnancy, it's slightly higher, which is also interesting. And then, um, which is not really captured as much in um, research is the fear of IPV. So that coercion is not really mentioned as much. So a high percentage in terms of IPV fear and remaining in the abusive relationship. And it's also um, past year is also experience is pretty high in this population. And the frequency is high, like the highest was three to five times experiencing intimate partner violence with their partner. Um, so not just the occurrence, but the frequency of it as well. So I guess in summary, um, this is a problem, especially among young mothers or young, um, young people with a foster care history. Um, and not only is it a problem, but there tends to be a pattern of intimate partner violence when we look at, for example, the frequency, high rates in terms of how frequent it is, as well as um, during pregnancy, that in indicates there might be a higher risk. Um, and I didn't talk much about this, but there's also a study published that talks about this population's um, 18 to 24 year old young women. I asked them whether they'd be interested in participating in the savings group and more than half said yes. And there was no difference based on their IPV experience. So whether they experienced it only in the past or in the past 12 years or how frequently they experienced it all, um, most of them felt that they would be interested in, in participating in the savings group. And this is just some work I've done that's published that just unfortunately tends to be um, a recurring problem within child welfare literature, but doesn't really get um, discussed or focused on in terms of intervention. So there's a lot of work in looking at statistics and rates, but not really programs on it. Um, so I think there's needs that there's a need for this program as well as it should be trauma informed as always and. Um, I think have some prevention efforts as well. I think that might be my last slide. Yes, oh, my ask, I guess we need your help. We are in the recruitment phase right now for the main pilot. So if you're in Arizona and you um, know any, I guess, moms who might fit the eligibility criteria or might be interested in this, please spread the word. Um, this is the flyer that, um, that goes out and it just has a QR code in the study's email address. And um, yeah, if you can share this flyer, then that'd be great. And I don't have my contact, but I am I am the Boom Study. <laughs> so if you were to message Boom Study at ASU, I would get that email. Um, and I think it's an easier email address to remember than my actual email address too. So um, I get the email. It's just a yeah, an incognito, I guess, address, but I am the room study at asu.edu. And that's also my phone number as well. We are also happy to share the flyer and your contact information with everybody who's attending. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Kelly. And that's it. And those are just the resources in case you, you have the slides and you wanted to look more into those different studies that I cited. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here. And and presenting the information on um, your study. Uh, do any of our members have any questions or comments? A question, Council Member Hodge. Please go ahead. Um, okay, so I know it's 18 to 24. Two questions I have. What if you just slightly out of that criteria of 18 to 24, is they, will they still work with you or is that something that's just a cutoff? Um, and what if you're, domestic partner isn't a male what if it's a female and you're in a female relationship so is that 
all those criteria does that cut you off completely for it or is it something else they can go into because I'm just curious on that yeah um, so the the age criteria is strict especially to 18 yeah. and older yeah. um, criteria um, and then the reason we, we started with Mel is because this is so small of a study and wanting to really be able to understand um, whether it works or not, first of all, before we expand it to other and um, and just needing to, I guess, have some in, in the research terms, I guess, really control. <laughs> Okay. For it. Um, but it's, we do, um, just because they had to have a male partner, it doesn't exclude moms based on their um, sexual identity or anything. Um, we, they, we do talk about, um, you know, in the, in the program, we do talk about how IPV affects others differently, depending on your sexual orientation as well. And um, moms in the study now do identify as not just straight, even if they do have a male partner or heterosexual. Um, so we don't exclude based on sexual orientation, but I think the reasoning behind the male partner um, is their risk of violence, like trying to understand whether the risk of violence is actually decreasing uh -huh. due to participation. Um, and if they weren't in a current relationship, we wouldn't be able to understand that from a research perspective and wanting it to make it as, because I hate to talk research term efficacy, but as clean as possible so that we do understand if it does work or if it doesn't work, why that is. So having that, that similarity across um, the characteristics. Thank you. I have one last question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also not only in my council member, I'm also a governing board member for Tempe Union High School District. So I was just wondering, do you guys reach out to any of the school districts to find out you know, because we do have uh, in the school districts, we have a lot of kids that are coming out of foster care group homes. And those are the ones that usually are in a kind of a violent relationship. So is there any way that you work with either people like, um, is there any information from the school districts or, you know, finding out if there's kids that could, could have that help or need that help? So I do want to, I did actually meet with a couple of people. I think it was Phoenix Union and I think Tempe. Um, and I know that there are different, like, I should say different um, different criteria that I need to meet in order to be able to advertise through the school district. So I need to apply for the approval. I should say different approval needed. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be as simple as just handing my flyer out. I need yeah. to go through a review process. Um, and that is something I have looked into as well to be able to do that. So okay. we're working on that. All right, thank you. If you ever need any help, let me know. As a government oh, yeah, I member. definitely do need help. Please okay, like, so. thank you. That would be great. Thank you. You're welcome. Great questions and very similar to questions I actually had. So I appreciate you asking those questions. Um, and uh, has, is there, is there any plan to look long term, um, like follow the children and see if there was an impact, a positive impact on the children? That's a good point. So we do this? ask some questions related to parenting in the site um, in the beginning of the survey, I'm excuse me, in the beginning of the program and at the end, three months later. Um, so we don't collect any data directly from the children and the children, the moms in the current, just to give you an idea of um, the age groups. We have a two month old, a mom who has a two month old, so very young. And then um, I think the oldest is a three year old. So we don't ask their children any questions directly, but we do ask the mothers about their parenting. Um, so I think that might be interesting to compare and we follow, we will follow moms up to three months after their participation to see if there is any difference before versus after participating. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the members or comments? Well, I hope that we're able to see a publication of the outcome of your study and we wish you well. Well, thank you so much for including that flyer. And as Kelly said, we'll make sure that we get that out to all of our members. Thank right. you. Thank you. Um, so moving on to item number eight, are there any requests by council members for an item on a future agenda? What I do have Calm one. down, people, calm down. I do have one. I would like for her to come. I'm asking on a future agenda for her to come back after the study is done and maybe 
give us an update of what happened on it. Um, that would be excellent. That's an excellent I would be happy to do that follow up. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Hearing no other um, recommendations for future agenda items. Um, are there any comments or announcements from our memberships? Hey, Vice Chair Ernst, this is Andy. Hi, Andy, go ahead. Uh, just a quick uh, note for everybody. Um, the uh, 49th Annual Pete's Officer, or Fallen Pete's Officer Memorial Service or Ceremony is actually Monday, May the 1st, uh, down at Wesley Ball Plaza, where we honor those law enforcement officers that were killed in the line of duty last year. So I just wanted to make everybody aware of that uh, event in case anybody was interested in it. Thank you so much. Well, yes, I would just like to add one, one quick comment from the staffing perspective. Absolutely. I know it's only April, but we meet every other month as a Domestic Regional Violence Regional Domestic Violence Council, and October will be here before we know it. And October, as you know, is when we honor Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So I would just like you to be thinking in the back of your minds if there are certain targeted populations you'd like us to outreach, if there are certain activities you would like us to coordinate. We have all summer to work on that, and we are here to help make that a reality. So please be in touch with the MAG staff if there's something that you're interested in having us focus on this year. Uh, thinking about what you said, this Councilman Hodge again, I was thinking about the schools. I was thinking about, is there any way, because a lot of the times that we don't go over enough of, domestic, of what is domestic violence in high schools, unless it's already happening. So maybe get something started with a pre-start of freshman year. This is what to look forward to or what can happen or, you know, signs or whatever um, to help out. So it doesn't get to the, to, to the effect part of it. You can kind of Perceive it before it happens. So something around that to to get younger kids to understand what domestic violence is and how to prevent it, or what is happening, what to do, um, because a lot of that comes in only if the what ifs afterwards. And I would just see if we can help out with that in our schools beforehand. Thank you, Councilman. We'll take note of that for sure. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so kind of excited in the city of Phoenix for an announcement that uh, we had been given some money to grow our program. In March, we held some major hiring events and uh, hopefully by the end of June or July, the city of Phoenix will have um, a total of six crisis response teams and six behavioral health teams that will respond out to 911 calls. Um, part of that is providing on-scene crisis intervention or behavioral health services to individuals who um, are experiencing domestic violence situations. So we're, we're really looking forward to being able to expand the services within our community as well as continue to work with our um, other partners within the city to um, impact uh, individuals who are experiencing domestic violence. So there's growth. <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, if, if, one more time, anybody else have anything else that they would like to announce regarding any programs or services out there? All right. Well, I want to thank you all for attending today. The next regional council will be on Thursday, June 1st at 2 p.m. Um, with no more further business, today's meeting is adjourned. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.